This is a public service announcement. Stop reading Haruki Murakami novels. Because he's the literary equivalent of fast food. He's a favourite of undergrads who like to think that they like to read, but actually want to complete books, which is of course a very different thing. Their eyes would slide over the pages in a half-aware daze, and they'd have music on in the background distracting them. Their inattention is bolstered not only by the simplicity of Murakami's prose, but by the fact that what happens in a typical Murakami book, from moment to moment, is often totally arbitrary and analogous to each of his books, to the point where a joke exists about Murakami Bingo, in which you can cross off protagonist cooking spaghetti, beautiful young woman disappearing, an odd thing happening to the moon, the, the presence of cats, western jazz. You can cross these off as they appear, and in regards to every book, you can complete most of, if not all, of the bingo card. This is not to say that I dislike Haruki Murakami. I actually enjoy most, if not all, of his books that I've read. I mean, as I said, it's the literary equivalent of comfort food or fast food. You can have it from time to time. The problem is that it doesn't really make you think most of the time. You very much know what you're getting. You know, the madness is under control. It's shrouded in a sort of impersonality by how clean and how dignified and how simple the prose is. I'd say that if you do want to read any more Haruki Murakami, skip all of the fiction and just go for these. This is, well, you can see what this is about. And it's mostly eyewitness accounts, which makes it worth more than just one man's writing. And then this, which I think I've talked about before, which is also quite worth your time. But if you're like me and you're tired of him, there's another place you should go. And that's the other Murakami. Yeah, this guy. How many of you have heard of this guy? Maybe a few of you, probably a lot of you, this is the internet, but probably nowhere near as many of you as who've heard of this guy. So who is Ryu Murakami? Well, he was born in the 50s. He has the same surname. He sort of explores human nature in the same strange, magical, realist way. But the way that Ryu Murakami does it is much different because it's much darker it's much more violent, there's more disillusionment. It's much more realistic in the sense, not in the sense of, you know, strange things don't happen, because plenty of strange things happen, especially in this one. But it's much more gritty, and it's much more sort of evil, you know? And that altogether makes Ryu Murakami much more interesting than Haruki Murakami. So I guess we should just go through the ones that I've got here. These three are some of his fa more famous books. There are two more, uh, Audition, I think, and Almost Transparent Blue. And by the way, if anyone knows where I can find Almost Transparent Blue for less than about $80, I'd be glad to have a link to that because I just, the last time I checked, I hadn't, I was absolutely unable to find it for a reasonable price. But anyway, so these two, are kind of similar. They're both, obviously, as you can see, very short. And they're both about serial killers. And the fun thing about Ryu Murakami is that, according to my research, he's gotten... That's not a word. He's captured the psyche of a serial killer extremely accurately, apparently. So, hey, if you're interested, these might be a fun place to start. This one's about... What would you say? It's about a foreign tourist who comes to the red light district and engages a Japanese tour guide for, you know, a bit of a sort of explicit fun. And as the night goes on, it's told from the tour guide's point of view. The tour guide begins to suspect that something is very, very wrong with his client. It's genuinely a scary novel. I mean, this is... I've got House of Leaves sitting around somewhere on my desk. And people keep saying that one gives you a sort of unnerving feeling, but I think this genuinely terrified me at some points. So do check this one out at least. And then we have Piercing, which is, again, very similar. A much less ambiguous state because, you know, the serial killer involved is definitely confirmed to be a serial killer. And it's about the intersection between that killer and a local... What was it? It was a prostitute, wasn't it? Or not a prostitute, but somebody who was very easily mistaken for one. 
And then we have Coin Lock of Babies, which is actually very similar to the other Murakami's Wind Up Bird, in the sense that it's about this sort of disillusionment of post-war Japan, and it's about how the characters involved don't really have any direction that's not decided by chance and by capital, and how they're struggling to make meaning of just bizarre things that are going on. But it's so much more crazy and drug fueled than this that it's almost a totally different type of book. Coin Locker Babies is about these, I haven't read this for years, but it's about two young boys who were abandoned in coin lockers, you know, like in public. And I hadn't heard about this, but apparently this is a phenomenon. People will abandon their kids inside like rentable lockers and just leave them there for other people to pick up it's like the equivalent of sticking them outside of the fire you know the fire station which is pretty mental but apparently people do that and the book sort of traces the different directions in which their lives go i haven't read it for a while but i do remember it being really very good so yeah public service announcement skip this murakami Go for this one. This is a sort of addendum to the video. The reuse of common symbols suggests that Murakami is going for the virtue of brevity, extra meaning superimposed on a smaller number of phenomena. One cat in one novel may point to another cat, and the cats may be compared, and the novels may make more, or a different kind of, sense. However, Murakami doesn't use this layering for any particular purpose. All his cats are just cats. The repetition is just a symptom of his tastes, rather than a book-crossing statement with a deeper meaning. Perhaps that's the point, but it leaves the reader with nowhere to go. It's a picture of his life, but he's not telling us anything particularly about it. Unless you want the author to be dead, there's nowhere else you can take it. For that reason, I consider him comfort food. I still like him, a lot, and then you say to me, well, if you want weird, what about his earlier, faster novels like Dance 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 and Wild Sheep Chase? None of them hold a candle to how strange the other Murakami gets. They also don't capture the spiritual deadness of the 80s and 90s in Japan in quite so bleak and dirty a manner. The use of different symbols and different ideas is not necessarily a virtue. The question here is range versus depth. I believe that, ultimately, every writer tries to achieve the same thing, the perfect expression of a life's worth of study packed into a single epigram. Now, whether that epigram is the length of Finnegan's Wake or whether it's the length of Italo Svevo's perfect hoax is irrelevant. All visible things are the result of a life's worth of practice and observation. I've made it a point to remember recently that every human who ever lived died in mid-investigation. No one ever watched, you see, or listened to, a concert. They listened to condensed practice, functionally sped up practice. A piano concert can be thought of as a speed run of piano practice. So for the time being, I am done with the big Murakami. But at what point can you say you're done with a writer? He's neither dead in reality or as an author. And perhaps he can still surprise me.